ಮಾಡ ಮಾಡ ಸರ್ ವಿ ಗುಡ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಯಾ ಓಕೆ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಹಲೋ ಎವರಿ ಒನ್ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಭಾನು ಸಂಗಸ್ ವರ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಕನ್ಸಲ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಎಮರ್ಜೆನ್ಸಿ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ಯಶೋಧ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ಸ್ ಕೇಂದ್ರಬಾದ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಟು ದ ಯಶೋಧ ಹಾಸ್ಪಿಟಲ್ ಎಮರ್ಜೆನ್ಸಿ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ಫ್ರೈಡೇ ಫ್ರೈಡೇ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಆನ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಅಪ್ರೈಸ್ ಆನ್ ಎಮರ್ಜೆನ್ಸಿ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ಸೊ ಟುಡೆ ಅವರ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಪೀರಿಯಾಟ್ರಿಕ್ ರೆಸ್ಪಿರೇಟರಿ ಎಮರ್ಜೆನ್ಸೀಸ್ ಟು ಸ್ಪೀಕ್ ವಿತ್ ಅಸ್ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಗಾಟ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶ್ರುತಿ ದೇಶಪಾಂಡೆ ಡಿ ಎನ್ ಬಿ ಎಮರ್ಜೆನ್ಸಿ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ವರ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಅಸಿಸ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಎಟ್ ರಾಮಯ್ಯ ಮೆಡಿಕಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಐ ಗೆಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿವ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಪೀರಿಯಾಟ್ರಿಕ್ ರೆಸ್ಪಿರೇಟರಿ ಎಮರ್ಜೆನ್ಸೀಸ್ ಸೊ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಎನಿ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾನ್ ಯು ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಟೈಪ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಚಾಟ್ ಬಾಕ್ಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಟೇಕನ್ ಕೇರ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಟ್ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸೆಷನ್ ಓ ಟು ಯು ಮ್ಯಾಮ್ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಆಲ್ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಭಾನು ಸಾಗರ್ ಸರ್ ಸಂಗರ್ ಸರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ವೆರಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಬಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ಟೇಕಿಂಗ್ ದ ಸೆಷನ್ ಸೊ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಡೀಲಿಂಗ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿತ್ ರೆಸ್ಪಿರೇಟರಿ ಎಮರ್ಜೆನ್ಸೀಸ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಪೀಡ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿವ್ ರೆಸ್ಪಿರೇಟರಿ ಎಮರ್ಜೆನ್ಸೀಸ್ ಅಪ್ರೋಚ್ ಆನ್ ರೆಸ್ಪಿರೇಟರಿ ಎಮರ್ಜೆನ್ಸೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ ಪಿಡಾಟಿಕ್ ಪೇಷಂಟ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ಐಮ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ನೌ Are you able to uh, see my screen? Yes, ma'am. There's some problem in uh, navigating the slides. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so we'll be talking on how to approach a pediatric patient with a respiratory emergency. Uh, so uh, by the end of the session, uh, I mean, we would uh, want to talk, uh, you know, we want to clarify regarding the signs of respiratory distress uh, in a pediatric patient. Uh, you need to differentiate between a child with respiratory distress and failure. Uh, listed, list some of the differential diagnosis of child presenting to emergency with respiratory distress and a few important uh, DDs we would like to discuss. So coming to the basic physiology. Um, so... Uh, there are some chemo the receptors chemo receptors in the located in the arch of aorta as well as carotid sinus these are the peripheral chemo receptors which detect uh, hypercarbia hypoxemia and uh, decrease uh, levels of ph in the blood uh, which uh, gives afferent signals to the uh, medullary that is the respiratory center of the brain there is a medullary center which again gives efferent signals to the thoracic cavity or the chest wall to st stimulate respiration so any dis dysregulation between uh, in any of the pathway would lead to respiratory distress so before going into the details let's discuss some of the anatomical differences in a uh, children uh, pertaining to the uh, pertaining to the respiration or the airway so uh, in children uh, compared to the adults the occiput the head is large uh, there is a prominent occiput so uh, during intubation uh, if you do not uh, you know there, there might be flexion of the neck and there will be difficulty to visualize visualize the cords so what we do is we can put a shoulder blades shoulder roll uh, um, below the shoulders to align the external auditory meatus and the sternal notch so that 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 is a important uh, significance for this the tongue is disproportionately larger in relation to the mouth hence uh, children are more prone to develop upper ear obstruction larynx is higher and the narrowest portion is required so coming to the physiological differences in children 
children are more more prone to develop severe hypoxemia respiratory distress and respiratory fatigue because of the following reasons first first thing is they have high oxygen consumption index high airway resistance high airway resistance is because of the narrowing of the upper as well as lower airways so this causes increased air resistance and they develop more chances of upper air obstruction or lower air obstruction causing severe hypoxemia and uh, respiratory distress as well as decreasing in the functional respiratory capacity and uh, the uh, as the ch the chest wall of the child is more more compliant and there will be a transverse placement of the uh, ribs attached to the thoracic cavity so what happens is uh, the chest wall the ability to in ability by the chest wall to increase the tidal volume will be uh, limited hence minute ventilation is highly dependent on the respiratory rate as minute ventilation is highly de dependent on the respiratory rate the chances of child going into res severe respiratory distress and respiratory fatigue is higher so these are the few physi physiological differences which you have to keep in mind when a child with respiratory distress come to emergency because there is uh, like uh, severe uh, uh, progression of the symptoms uh, and the severe progression from respiratory distress to respiratory failure. So this that, that's why this these points are important and should be kept in mind. So uh, pertaining to symptoms of respiratory distress failure, we can go by ABCD approach. Uh, and uh, coming to the airway, child with presenting with respiratory distress would have an open or a maintainable airway. But when it goes progresses to respiratory failure, the child's airway may, may not be patent. Coming to the breathing, child coming with respiratory distress would be tachypneic with increased effort of breathing. When it progresses to failure, the, uh, the child would become bradypneic or apneic with decreased effort of breathing. Coming to the circulation part, uh, the child would be tachycardic, and presenting with uh, respiratory distress would be tachycardic, pale. But as the child progresses to respiratory failure, the child would become bradycardic and cyanotic. Uh, coming to the disability, uh, respiratory distress children would be ang anxious, agitated. And when you know, the child is becoming lethargic to unresponsive, that time you have to think that the child is going into respiratory failure. So this is very important to identify whether the child is in respiratory distress or the child is, respiratory is, in res is going into respiratory failure because uh, immediate and prompt intervention is required to avoid child developing respiratory arrest. So any patient, any child coming to the emergency with respiratory distress should undergo an initial assessment that is the doorway assessment. Uh, as you all know, there is something called as a PAT triangle or the pediatric assessment triangle, which contains three components, one A, A, B, and C. A is for appearance, where there are few parameters, that is tone, interactiveness, consolability, abnormal look, abnormal speech or cry. B is work of breathing, where you have to check for abnormal, any abnormal sounds, abnormal position, retraction, flaring, acne, or gasping. And coming to the color of the skin, you, you have to assess whether the child is pink, pale, cyanotic, or mottled. So after the initial or the doorway assessment is done, you move on to the primary survey where you check for airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Where you check, check whether the airway is patent or not, the respiratory rate, the saturation, the work of breath, the uh, breath sounds, any any presence of any retractions, chest retractions, uh, checking for the heart rate, checking for the BP, checking for the capillary, capillary field time, and doing an AVPU score. After that, you, you proceed with the detailed sample history where you're checking, uh, where you're asking the history regarding uh, signs and symptoms, allergies, any medications, past medical history, last meal, and events preceding followed which you come to the secondary survey and head to examination. After which you can formulate your DDs depending whether the respiratory distress is because of pulmonary cause, cardiac cause, GI cause, or any miscellaneous cause like metabolic cause or CNS cause. So coming, we'll be mainly discussing a pulmonary causes today. So coming to the pulmonary causes, it can be divided into upper airway obstruction, lower airway obstruction, lung parenchymal disease, or any pleural disorders. Coming to the upper area obstruction, mainly caused by uh, any foreign body aspiration, 
infections like croup, epiglottitis, retropharyngeal abscess, anaphylaxis, any mass, or the con congenital lesions like laryngomalacia or vascular rings and all. And the specific findings of apparatus obstru obstruction other than increased respiratory rate uh, or inspiratory effort is strider, change in voice, drooling, snoring, or gurgling sounds. So these are few of the specific findings related to upper air obstruction. Coming to the lower air obstruction, the most important causes are either asthma, bronchiolitis, and the specific signs related to the lower air obstruction is wheezing with a prolonged respiratory phase. Coming to the lung parenchymal disease, the causes mainly are pneumonia, ARDS, and pulmonary contusion. The signs pertaining specific to the lung parenchymal disease is grunting, crackles, diminished breath sounds, and fever in cases of pneumonia. Coming to the pleural disease, the most important causes are either pneumothorax, hemothorax, or pleural effusion, and the most specific findings are diminished or absent breath sounds on one side. So these are the few signs pertaining to the levels of uh, the level of obstruction as well as any lung parenchymal disease or any uh, pleural disorders. Now coming to the upper ear obstruction, the most important uh, sign is uh, strider here. And uh, the strider, you can formulate a differential diagnosis based on few parameters. That is, if the child is feb afebrile, you can think regarding any foreign body aspiration, angioedema, or hypocalcemia, which can cause spasm and cause area, upper area obstruction. But if the child is febrile, you can differentiate, you can divide it into whether the child has uh, child has a low grade fever or a high grade fever. If the child has low grade fever, it, you can think regarding croup or diphtheria. If the child has high grade fever, you can think about epiglottitis, retropharyngeal abscess, or bacterial trachitis. Now, coming to one of the most important causes of upper ear obstruction is croup. It is a, uh, it's an inflammation of larynx trachea. It is nothing but a laryngobronchitis. So what, at, what uh, it causes, it causes inflammation and narrowing of the passage. Hence, there'll be turbulence in the airflow, causing uh, in some, uh, a very harsh inspiratory sound called as a croup, called as a strider in croup. So it accounts for most of the cases of strider in children and affects it uh, primarily affects children aged between six months to three years. It is commonly caused by a para-influenza virus and can also be caused by a few other viruses like respiratory syncytial virus. So clinical features are, uh, it uh, the onset typically is uh, begins one to two, three days after nasal congestion. So before there'll be all the prodromal symptoms like uh, uh, URI kind of symptoms like nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, cough, and low-grade fever, followed which the child would develop classical symptoms of harsh barking cough, hoarseness of voice, and strider. Symptoms are worse at night and severity correlates with airway edema and inflammation. So basically, croup is a clinical diagnosis where the role of X-ray or any blood investigations is not is limited. So there's no role of any radiological or blood investigations in croup. It is, it is uh, mainly a clinical diagnosis. Additional test may be required only if you're suspecting any alternative diagnosis like epiglottitis, uh, any abscess, or uh, the child fails to respond to any to the conventional therapy. X-ray X-rays are not uh, routinely performed, uh, but if it is performed, 50% of uh, of children, the X-ray shows something called a steeple sign. Here you can see a steeple sign where uh, there is subglottic narrowing. So uh, there is something called as a modified Wesley Croup score to uh, classify the severity of Croup into mild, moderate, and severe Croup. So uh, the parameters which are used are inspiratory strider, intercostal retractions, air entry, cyanosis, and level of consciousness. So if there is, uh, so in cases of mild croup, if if uh, the, uh, based on the points which is given, uh, it is classified into mild, moderate, and severe croup. If it is, if the points are less than four, it is mild croup. If the point uh, with uh, is four to four to six, it, if it is between four to six, it is moderate group, and if it is more than six, it is severe group. So, based why is this important is based on these uh, scoring systems, the treatment can be planned. 
there are some other uh, severity assessment which uh, is used by the Indian Academy of Pediatric uh, ped Pediatricians. Uh, here the parameters are uh, sensorium, sensorium of the child, respiratory distress, whether it is present or absent, or Hello. Hello. I think uh, she's having some uh, internet issues. Yeah. Am I audible here? Yeah, yeah. ma'am, you're audible. Okay. okay. Are you able to uh, see my screen? Yeah, 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 you are able to. Uh, just give me two minutes. Yeah. Uh, so is is my screen visible now? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, sorry for the uh, issue because it is raining heavily here. So the uh, power is just going okay. and coming. Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry for that. Uh, so I was uh, telling regarding the uh, severity of the uh, group, the scoring system of group. We had discussed regarding the modify Wesley uh, group score. There's some other severity assessment which is uh, used by the uh, Indian Academy of uh, Pediatricians, where the parameters are sens uh, sensorium, respiratory distress, strider, heart rate, and saturation uh, levels, where it is classified into mild to moderate, severe, and life threatening group. So, the treatment, the initial treatment is the baby or the child should be kept on the mother's lap. There should not be any painful stimulus to the child. Try to avoid putting IV cannulas, draw blood tests, or shift the child to the X-rays or and any sort of thing because you're not you're not if you do that or if you if the child cries, so it will worsen the situation. So the upper air obstruction will be worsened. So hence all this should be avoided. So oxygen is administered to maintain saturation more than 94 to 95 percent, postpone any IV access and never shift the, uh, the child to the X-ray before stabilizing the child. The specific treatment is the initial, the first line treatment is a steroid. It is an oral dexamethasone with a dose of around 0.15 mg per kg to 0.6 mg per kg. IVIM can also be used. Epinephrine, uh, they say racemic epinephrine is uh, better, but uh, there, there has been studies where uh, even L-epinephrine is as uh, good and efficient as uh, racemic epinephrine. This is usually used in a moderate to severe group. The dose is 0.5 ml per kg. Example, if the child is around 8, uh, 8 kgs, you take 4 ml of epinephrine and dilute it in 1 ml of NS and then give via nebulizer. You can give nebulization. So something called as Heliox. Uh, it's a ratio, uh, it is a mixture between helium and oxygen at a, at a ratio of around 80s to 20 or 70s to 30. This uh, this is used because I, uh, there's a theory that it creates a 
laminar flow it uh, changes the turbulent flow into laminar flow thus causing decreasing the work of breathing it's a temporary uh, it provides a temporary improvement and but this improvement is not sustained so it is not routinely recommended so as mentioned before based on the uh, severity of croup the the treatment uh, can be followed if it is a mild croup then you can orally administer dexamethasone a steroid that with a dose of 0.6 mg per kg counsel the patients the parents and then can the child can be discharged if the croup is moderate to severe then administer oral dexamethasone along with nebulized adrenaline administer oxygen if the saturation is below 94 to 95% observe for 4 hours if the symptoms improve then uh, it is said that you can counsel and discharge if the symptoms do not improve retain the child and uh, retain the child in the hospital itself uh, but in the indian scenario better to uh, admit patients with moderate to severe crew because of the various social factors and uh, uh, parents education as well as uh, the not that good pre hospital uh, setup in india so hence retaining the uh, ch child in moderate to severe group is uh, necessary. Mm, intubation for severe group is only indicated if the child is going into respiratory failure. Uh, otherwise, it is it, uh, it is not, uh, I mean, it is only recommended for a child who is going to respiratory failure. It is not recommended. If you're intubating a child, then use an endotracheal tube of which is 0.5 to 1 millimeter smaller than that of the standard size. Now, the criteria for admission for croup is severe respiratory distress, any unusual symptoms like hypoxia, hyperpyrexia, where you are suspecting some other alternative diagnosis, Dehi the child is dehydrated, if there is persistent strider in spite of giving epinephrine and steroids, and a complex past medical history where, like the history of any prematurity or any congenital heart disease, these are the criteria for admission in a child with croup. Now coming to epiglottitis, here there is an inflammation of, this is also one of the common causes of uh, upper ear obstruction in children. Here there is inflammation of epig epiglottis, the area epiglottic folds, as well as the retinoids. This causes supraglottic uh, obstruction. So it's an ac acute, rapidly progressive disease where the child uh, looks toxic. And it is uh, before the era of immunization with the Haemophilus influenza B. Uh, it, uh, Haemophilus influenza type B was the most common cause of epiglottitis in children in the younger age group. But after the vaccination era, now it uh, now it is more common in the older age group with mean age of mean age group of around six to twelve years. The other causes of uh, Epiglottitis nowadays is streptococcal species, streptococcal species, as well as Neisseria species. The clinical features are there's an abrupt onset of fever, strider, drooling, and sore throat. The child would uh, is not would will not be able to swallow the secretions. Hence, there will be drooling. There's a rapid progression of the disease, and the child will be having respiratory distress. There's absence of cough and muffled voice. Child assumes the position of tripod so that to make the airway patent. To maintain the airway, the child assume, assumes this tripod position. So whenever you suspect a child with epiglottitis, immediate, immediately re immediate recognition is important and tries to the resuscitation area. Continuous monitoring by someone trained in management of difficult airway. Rapid consultation with ENT as well as anesthesiologist is necessary. Try to avoid transfer the child to any uh, area like uh, like a radiological area or any area unless there is continuous and appropriate monitoring. So here also diagnosis is mainly clinical. For young children, securing airway takes precedence over diagnostic evaluation as uh, young children are more prone to ra rapidly progress because of the narrow passages compared to the older children. So, securing airway is very important more than that of the diagnostic evaluation. So, unless you maintain the airway, you do not shift the child for any diagnostic evaluation. 
Otherwise, by direct laryngoscopy, if you can visualize, there will be uh, swelling and the inflammation of the epiglot epiglottis. X-ray, if it is done, it, it, uh, there might be sign of uh, something called as a thumb sign on the X-ray, lateral uh, neck X-ray. So treatment is the, keep the child seated upright, provide oxygen, IV antibiotics, and uh, if the child, uh, if you're performing intubation, the most skilled indiv individual should perform the intubation. Consult other experts in airway management like anesthesiologist. Uh, and you have to keep the, in, the dif difficult airway cart ready with multiple endotracheal tube sizes. Antibiotics are continued for seven to 10 days. Steroids can be helpful to reduce the mucosal edema. And you need to admit all the patients with suspected or confirmed epiglottitis to an ICU care setting. So, uh, other differential diagnosis of upper ear obstruction are one is anaphylaxis. Here, there is abrupt onset, and there's always a trigger which is associated with anaphylaxis. There might there might be urticaria rashes as, as well as other organ system involvement also. So, treatment here is I am epinephrine. Bacterial trachitis, the child will be extremely toxic. There will be high-grade fever uh, and uh, symptoms are also very much prolonged. Here, the treatment is uh, IV antibiotics and uh, airway ABC, that is airway management, IV hydration, IV antibiotics and ICU admission. Retropharyngeal abscess, the child uh, will be having high fever, toxic appearance as well as torticollis. There will be neck pain. The child will be reluctant to extend the neck or to move the neck side by side. It is one of the uh, uh, sign of uh, retropharyngeal abscess. Uh, here the treatment is same, the air management, IV hydration, IV antibiotics. Foreign body of aspiration, there'll be history of any choking episodes and absence of any upper respiratory tract infections. The treatment here is, if the child is less than one year, you give the back blows as well as uh, chest compressions. If the child is more than one year, you perform the helmic maneuver. So these are some of the, briefly, I have highlighted some of the important points uh, of upper air obstruction uh, uh, differential diagnosis. Now coming to the lower air obstruction, the most uh, important is bronchiolitis. It's an acute infectious disease with inflammation of the smaller airways. Here the smaller airways are involved, that is the bronchioles are involved. So it uh, typically occurs uh, in the age group of less than two years and uh, most commonly, caused by respiratory syncytial virus. So because of the necrosis and loss of epithelium and inflammation, there'll be a peribronchial coughing as well as uh, inflammation and increased secretions in the bronchioles causing collapse of the alveoli. The clinical features include a prodromal symptoms like rhinorrhea and wheezing, and fever will be present, might be present in one third of the patients. Most important signs are and uh, rhinorrhea. So there's something called a bronchiolitis assessment tool to assess the severity of bronchiolitis, which is not commonly used. But there are a few parameters like feeding, saturation, SpO2, respiratory rate, accessory muscle use, retractions, wheeze, and air exchange, where you can classify into mild, moderate, and severe, severe uh, bronchiolitis. One more thing you have to remember is in bronchiolitis, because of the increase uh, secretions, the nasal secretions, uh, feeding will be interrupted. Uh, so the child would not be taking much feeds. Hence, uh, and, and along with that, there is increased respiratory effort and uh, uh, tachypnea. All this will contribute to insensible water losses and dehydration. So the most important thing you have to remember in bronchiolitis is more prone for dehydration. That's why capillary refill, you have to check for the capillary refill time. So here also the diagnosis is clinical and uh, only diagnostic imaging can be used. It will be helpful if the child is in very severe respiratory distress, hypoxia or any atypical presentation. Treatment involves supportive care like nasal suctioning, uh, hydration, maintaining hydration and supplemental oxygen if the child is hypoxic. If there are thickened secretions, they say hypertonic saline can be, uh, uh, can be used. Uh, to thin down the secretions and then do the suctioning, but its use is limited. 
and not routinely recommended. Uh, one thing now is heated humidified HFNC and other forms of uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Heated humidified HFNC, is, uh, it has a role in uh, severe bronchitis because uh, it reduces the work of breathing, rec recruits the alveoli, makes the alveoli patent. Routine use of uh, uh, any bronchodilators like short-acting uh, uh, bronchodilators, beta agonists, or corticosteroids is not recommended for bronchitis. It, it is not helpful. So here is the Cochrane uh, analysis where uh, it uh, shows the efficacy of HFNC in severe bronchitis. It has shown that there is decreased work of breathing and uh, improvement of symptoms with uh, use of HFNC. But the criteria for admission is the if the child is having severe disease of severe form of bronchitis, severe disease, unable to maintain oral hydration, frequent need of suctioning. Uh, these are the some of the criteria for admission. There's something called as a uh, palivizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody, which can be used as a prophylaxis uh, for high risk populations. It is a monoclonal antibody against RSV. Now coming to one more uh, differential diagnosis of fluor obstruction is asthma. Uh, it uh, is more, mainly common in more than two years of age. So any child who is wheezing who is less than two years of age, think about bronchitis. If the child is more than two years of age, think about asthma. So it's a lower airway disease characterized by bronchoconstriction, mucosal edema, and pulmonary secretions. So there's a trigger factor, there's airway inflammation, the sec uh, increased secretion of mucus, airway muscle con uh, constriction and um, the swelling of the bronchial membranes causing narrowing of the passages, causing wheezing, cough, shortness of breath and tightness of chest. So how do you differentiate between uh, the other, other causes of air obstruction is in bronchitis, usually there will be upper respiratory tract infect, uh, symptoms like uh, there'll be there might be fever there might be rhinorrhea cough and all but here in asthma usually it is uh, uh, there will be wheezing cough as well as chest, chest tightness prodromal symptoms are not present in asthma croup uh, uh, it there'll be mostly there's this inspired there's strider present in croup and uh, it responds croup responds to epinephrine uh, nebulized epinephrine uh, compared to asthma pneumonia there will be fever there will be crackles or decreased breath sounds or there will be folk, asymmetrical wheezing cardiac disorders there will be raised there will be uh, uh, crepitations murmurs and asymmetric wheezing suggests of pneumonia or a foreign body diagnosis is clinical chest x-ray and ABG is mostly not required X indications of chest x-rays when there is fever which is not explained by any apparent viral illness, if there is any life-threatening exacerbations, focal findings, if there's history of any stroke, history of uh, uh, suggestive of uh, pneumothorax, that is subcutaneous emphysema, or if there is any diagnostic uncertainty or any cardiac etiology. In ABG, if there is high or apparently normal uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide in a child with hypoxia, it indicates impending respiratory failure. So if you if any child presented with asthma, if you do an ABG, if, it, if the PCO2 is normal or if it is high on the higher side, then you think that the child is going into respiratory failure. So a prompt in prompt uh, you know intervention and alertness is required. Measurement of peak expiratory flow rate is not routinely recommended in exacerbations because the child may not cooperate. So to assess the severity of asthma is something called as PRAM scoring. Here, the parameters are oxygen saturation, suprasternal retractions, scalene muscle contractions, air entry, wheezing. So depending on the severity, if the score is between 0 to 3, it is classified as mild asthma. If it is 4 to 7, it is classified as moderate asthma. If it is 8 to 12, it is classified as severe asthma. PRAM scoring is really important for us to uh, assess and uh, to assess and to classify the severity of asthma. Treatment is the first line of treatment is beta two agonist. It is a, a bronchodilator. Uh, it acts on the beta receptors of the uh, bron bronchus, this causing bronchodilatation. is the first line treatment in asthma. 
either albuterol or salbutamol can be used. Okay. Next is steroids. Next is anticholinergic agents. That is epiratropium bromide. This can be used. This this is also put. This is also a bronchodilator. It can be used in conjunction with the uh, beta agonist. Like it can be used in conjunction with albuterol or salbutamol. For severe cases, magnesium can be used. Ketamine, uh, if the child is going into respiratory failure, life-threatening asthma, near-fatal asthma, going into respiratory failure, and where it, uh, where you're planning to intubate, the indication, uh, the induction agent of choice is IV ketamine because it's a potent uh, bronchodilator. So uh, regarding the bronchodilators, uh, albuterol or salbutamol, uh, it can be used as a uh, meter dose inhaler as well as a nebulizer. So if you're using a MDI, uh, for according to the age group, the, the, the doses are recommended. For one to three years, four puffs per dose can be given. Four to six years, six puffs per dose. Seven years and older, eight puffs per dose. So, and if you're using as a nebulizer, if for uh, less than 10 kgs, the dose is uh, 1.25 mg. 10 to 20 kg, it loses 2.5 mg, and greater than 20 kg, it is 5 mg. The difference between MDI and nebulizing is uh, the efficacy is same for both the uh, forms of treatment. But in an M if the child is using MDI, the adverse effects of uh, palpitations, tremors, and tachycardia is a bit lesser when the child is using MDI. Steroids, uh, oral root can be preferred or parental route depending on the severity score of the asthma. If oral route uh, is uh, preferred, then prednisone can be given at, uh, at the dose of around 2 mg per kg. Parental route, methylprednisone can be given up to 1 mg per kg per dose. Magnesium sulfate for uh, a very severe form of asthma, that is life-threatening asthma, can be given at the dose of around 50 mg per kg, 50 to 75 mg per kg over 20 to 30 minutes. So treatment according to the uh, score. So if it is a mild asthma, uh, you give bronchodilators that is short-acting beta agonist. If it is a moderate asthma with short-acting beta agonist, you are giving oral corticosteroids as soon as possible. If it is a severe form of asthma, you are giving nebulized uh, form of uh, albuterol as well as ipratropium bromide. I'll you are giving three dose three times continuously along with systemic corticosteroid as soon as possible. If it is an impending uh, respiratory failure, administer 100% of oxygen, uh, support ventilation if required by bag and mask, continuous cardiopulmonary monitoring is required, continuous nebulization, systemic corticosteroids as soon as possible, and then uh, can, you can consider IV magnesium sulfate when you're intubating you uh, induction agent of choice is IV ketamine. So this is something which is uh, easy for you to uh, understand. So here I have taken this from Rosen's. Here, if there's a mild asthma, you are giving the short-acting beta agonist. Moderate, you're giving uh, short-acting beta agonist with the oral corticosteroid. If it is severe, you're giving nebulization continuous back to back three times along with um, the, along, along with uh, the IV corticosteroids, along with and IV magnesium can also be given, and epinephrine can also be considered IM. So based on the response, you are deciding on disposition. So uh, putting it all together. So once you do a PAT assessment, if you see a child with normal normal appearance, normal work of breathing, normal circulation, then you think then you uh, classify classify as there's the child is not in respiratory distress. If the child is having abnormal appearance, abnormal work of breathing, abnormal circulation, then the child is in cardiorespiratory arrest. Here, what you do is immediate intervention. You have to start CPR and bag and mask and intubation. If the child is having normal appearance, abnormal work of breathing, and normal circulation, then you, then the child is in respiratory distress. If the child is having abnormal appearance, abnormal work of breathing, and normal circulation, then you can classify as respiratory failure. Here, the primary intervention, what you do is, if there's an oxygenation problem, give oxygen. 
if the child is progressing to failure, give do bag and mask ventilation and intubation. Ventilation pro problem, reposition the child, use of NIV. The child is progressing into failure, then do bag and mask ventilation and intubation. Following which you do your secondary examination, try to determine the etiology and treat the underlying cause. So this summarizes the approach and a few of the differential di important differential diagnoses. So these are my references. Any questions? No questions yet, ma'am. I don't think so. There are any questions, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So thank you so much, ma'am, for your time and sharing some valuable information with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here and giving me the opportunity to uh, present my uh, session in front of you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am.